Hello, hello, and welcome to another installment of Lennon Hawk Talk. I am David Lennon Hawk, and these are my podcasty type YouTube uploads that are audio only because they are faster for me to speak extemporaneously and upload these. So I'm recording this on October 11th. Uh, if you do not follow me on any other social medias, your, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, your Twitters, all that stuff. You may not know this, uh, but I recently went through a breakup. Uh, as some of you, if you've watched my videos, I've mentioned a fiancé at times. Uh, that'll stop. <laughs> because, uh, uh, yeah, um, the relationship I was in for about four and a half years uh, ended recently. So um, I'm working through that, you know, the various emotions involved and stuff. So... Uh, because of that, I haven't felt like uploading anything outside of also just being very busy this month, as I have um, mentioned in uh, previous videos, like the last Vinegar Syndrome unboxing. So just a, a heads up, if I don't upload much aside from the normal like Vinegar Syndrome and whatnot, that's the, the reason why right now I'm working through all of that stuff. But that's all I want to say about that, except um, if you have a really good breakup song uh, that you listen to uh, when things go south that has helped you through a breakup. I have my own songs, but uh, drop a drop a comment. Uh, let me know what your your uh, breakup songs that have helped you through breakups in the past are, because, you know, sometimes I just want to listen to that kind of stuff. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a couple of things. One is sort of a follow-up to the last Leonard Hawk talk, which was about uh, Blonde and the rating, now that the movie's out and I've seen it and reviewed it, and many of you have seen it as well. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about horror movies, because it is October. So, when I uh, made that video or audio about Blonde, my big thesis of that was let's not judge the movie before it's out because people were judging it, basically prejudicing it, prejudging it, uh, based on what they thought was in the movie but what they were not sure of because they hadn't seen it. Uh, they were judging it based on, you know, conjecture or the content of the novel that it's based on and that sort of thing. Uh, now that I've seen it, uh, it's not a very good movie. It's... Uh, it is, uh, it is well made, it's visually interesting at many times, but it's mainly two and a half hours of wallowing in misery, uh, and I'm not sure why the director felt that he wanted to take that approach to this material, or why he felt compelled to make this movie based on that type of material. Uh, I don't see what the what the point is like is he trying to make a point about how hollywood chews women up and spits them out is he trying to just make something that's about marilyn monroe specifically i i'm not sure uh but generally i i just think it was sort of a, a nasty brutal lengthy film uh that is not enjoyable to watch even if you may admire some of the craftsmanship behind it uh, but whatever the point of the movie was, I think the film is too punishing to do that. Uh, but as far as, since I, I was largely talking about the NC-17 and sort of this uh, puritanical idea behind sex and sexual content in films, uh, the film has uh, a decent amount of nudity and some sex scenes as well. But I believe the NC-17 is specifically because of one scene and it involves a sort of coerced sex act uh, perpetuated by JFK. Uh, and the way that it's shot and the way that it's handled in the film, it makes me think that that is the scene that gave it the NC-17. Because the things that the the ratings board uh, tends to frown on of, 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 as far as sex goes, it's not necessarily just plain nude bodies. It's, it's usually like sex scenes and thrusting and certain movements and things like that. And I, I believe that scene with JFK, which is the only JFK scene in the movie, uh, probably went a bridge too far for them. Um, if, I think if you had cut that scene out of the film, it probably just would have been a hard R, and, and that would probably be about it. Um, but yeah, so now we, we know that. Um, but I also wanted to talk about, since I, I talked in that one a little bit about the rating system and how movie theaters would normally not show a movie that had an NC-17 rating, uh, aside from like art houses and things like that, 
post Showgirls. After Showgirls bombed, it sort of sullied the NC-17 rating in the mainstream eyes. And then theaters, much like Blockbuster, much like uh, newspaper chains that would publish, you know, the the print ads for movies with the Showtimes before the internet. Uh, they would not want to run any of the NC-17 stuff. They sort of capitulated to this sort of puritanical uh, aspect of the rating system. But uh, I recently saw a film that was released unrated uh, and had a small release in theaters. It was put into about uh, under 900 theaters with uh, unrated and for the most part it was only shown once or twice a day to like nighttime shows so not midnight shows but like a seven a a seven o'clock set and a ten o'clock set kind of like that Uh, and that was the movie terrifier 2 uh terrifier 2 was released unrated but there is no doubt in my mind that if it was shown to the ratings board they would have given it an nc-17 for violence uh there is no uh female nudity in the movie that I recall, um, there is a prosthetic penis that gets sliced off, but no female nudity. So it, it definitely would not have been an NC-17 for sexual content. It would have been the rare movie that gets an NC-17 solely for violent content, uh, which is pretty rare nowadays. Uh, I mean, movies like Hostel and Hostel 2 and, and all of the Saw movies, sometimes they have to trim a little bit for the MPA to give them an R rating, but all of those have been given an R rating. Uh, they, they, they have been able to be successfully cut and still stay pretty gory, um, but certain uh, of those more recent horror movies have gotten more of the axe than others. Obviously, in the 80s, during the slasher movie craze, the MPA cracked down on a lot of these movies, so some of them got like chopped to bits to get the R rating. Friday the 13th Part 7 comes up. That one got butch- uh, just massacred, butchered by the MPA. The- they're a bit more lenient on violence now. Um, but Terrifier 2 would have definitely got an NC-17. And I was as I was watching the movie in a theater, what struck me is that this movie is normally not the type of movie that a mainstream movie chain, because I went to see this at a Regal, uh, but Regal, AMC, a bunch of other ones, um, a bunch of mainstream, uh, you know, mass market movie theater chains, not just your Alamos or your Rialtos or anything like that. Uh, They were showing it, and it just struck me that pre-COVID, they probably would not have. And what I'm basing that on is something that happened in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, um, a director uh, who was behind the Hatchet movies, uh, the Hatchet movies are sort of these uh, neo-slashers uh, about a, a swamp person in, in the New Orleans swamp um, who's played by uh, Kane Hodder, who played Jason in four of the Jason films. Uh, but they're basically slasher horror comedies. And when the second one was coming out, uh, it was unrated, and it had the level of violence that you'd normally see in an an NC-17 film. Uh, It probably, I'm not sure if it could get an R or would deserve an R versus an NC-17, but I'm guessing that if it went before the ratings board, they probably would have given it an NC-17, even with the humorous context, because the MPA is a bit more lenient on horror comedies versus straight horror when it comes to violence. Uh, Just as, you know, they're easier on movies where blood is a different color than red and stuff like that. Uh, But originally, Hatchet 2 was going to play for like one or two weekends exclusively at AMC theaters. Uh, So obviously the AMC back then and now is still the the largest movie theater chain in North America. Um, But I think they showed it for one day and then there was like some controversy or brouhaha that happened online and then they just pulled it uh, the second day. So there was only like one night they showed it when they were supposed to show it for like two weeks uh, because of the uproar over showing this movie that was unrated for violence. And I was just thinking back to that because that sort of showed in the early 2000s that there was still this sort of taboo over showing something that was stronger than R. Even though it was released without an official rating, it was just released unrated, um, the fact that it would have been the equivalent of an NC-17 meant that AMC decided to pull it. But now, post-COVID... Um, we're kind of in a slump as far as theatrical releases go. Basically, there's been no 
major blockbusters since July, and the next blockbuster uh, around the corner isn't until Black Panther Wakanda Forever in November. So right now you're getting some small movies, and some of those are hits. Uh, Smile has done well at the box office. Barbarian did well. Um, some so so good, uh, you know, some wins for the horror genre there. Uh, but other stuff, Amsterdam Bros, they've they've bombed quite considerably. And then you've had other stuff that you know they might eke out a small profit, like Woman King, um, but not you know they're not knocking the doors off the theater or anything. So right now theaters are sort of desperate for product to sort of uh, let them coast and survive until we start to get more blockbusters around you know Thanksgiving and Christmas season. You know the big Oscar contenders, some of the stuff like Black Panther, things like that. And because of that. I think that is why um, the the distribute the distributors behind Terrifier Two were so lucky to find you know a, almost a thousand theaters, almost what would count as a wide release. This was like in the high eight hundreds of screens, uh, but eight eight hundred plus theaters, just shy of nine hundred, to show this movie, and the movie ended up doing uh, quite well for a for a almost no budget crowd funded horror movie. It's uh, I believe for like a day it knocked Top Gun Maverick out of the top 10, the first movie to do that. And I think it finished at number 10 for the weekend box office this past weekend. So much so that was something that was only going to be a one weekend uh, little release before it goes directly to uh, the screen box uh, streaming service from Bloody Disgusting. They've extended it for another weekend. So Terrifier 2 will still be playing uh, this upcoming weekend as I'm speaking now. Uh, but this is definitely the goriest movie I have ever seen in a movie theater. It's it's probably not the goriest movie I've ever seen, period, because uh, I've seen, you know, old Italian movies and giallos and, you know, French extremity films and then stuff that gets pretty gory. Uh, but I've never seen anything this gory actually in a movie theater, let alone a regal as opposed to, like, Alamo, which which would show uh, more artsy stuff or more... Uh, taboo stuff of that nature and, and things. And and so it just sort of struck me how financial realities have led to this, this sea change where, I don't know, it must have been like 15 years ago or something that Hatchet 2 uh, was a big problem for AMC to show, but now AMC, Regal, Cinemark, all of the main chains are showing Terrifier 2, this 2 hour and 18 minute slasher epic with just reams of gore there is there is one kill halfway through that movie that is so over the top and so gory and so out there that i was just i think my mouth was agape watching this thing in theaters and you know shout out to the people who made terrifier 2 because the day i saw terrifier 2 was the day I got broken up with. Uh, so I really needed a, a movie to take my mind off of things, and it was going to need to be a good movie to do that, and I enjoyed the fuck out of Terrifier 2. I mean, I like the first Terrifier quite a bit. I've met the director. I've met the guy who plays art. I've had photo ops with them. You know, I talked to the director, Damien Leone, about what camera he used on the first one versus what one he was going to shoot this one with and everything. Um... But this was uh, surpassed expectations as far as what I wanted the movie to be. But it, it just it was just so weird to sit there and be like, you know, there is not a drop of controversy about a major theater chain showing this movie. I mean, as the movie came out over the weekend, there were some anecdotal reports of people vomiting or passing out or whatever, which always leads to the question of, what movie did they think they were seeing? Like, if, you, if you've seen Terrifier 1, I don't think you should be surprised by anything in Terrifier 2. So most of the audience coming to see this movie knows what to expect, and I don't think they would be affected that way. So the only thing I can think of is that some people brought a plus one with them who didn't know what to expect. Either somebody dragged a friend to it, or they dragged a significant other who wasn't prepared, and that happened. Uh, or... 
because I can't imagine a lot of like walk up business to this movie that you walk up to the theater not sure what you want to watch on the marquee at box office you see Terrifier 2 the fact that it has a number 2 at the end of it means that it is the sequel so I don't know who would go into a movie not having seen the first like that just because it happens to be showing when you've arrived <laughs> though I do remember uh, one of my favorite stories of seeing people who definitely were in a movie they shouldn't have been was when I went to go see Clerks 2 and there was two or three old biddies, old ladies who sat in like the front row of the upper section and they arrived a little late and the, and so I, I was not sure because this is not the demographic for a Kevin Smith sequel and then there's that conversation in the movie about whether it's okay to go ass to mouth and the three ladies just stand up and they walk out. So that told me either they didn't know what it was and it was just something that they were showing. Because old people who don't know a lot about movies, they'll often, I, I know this from working at a theater for a while, they'll go to box office and they'll ask, oh, what's that about? Is it good? So maybe they were like, oh, what type of movie is Clerks 2? And maybe the box office person just said, oh, it's a comedy. It's a funny movie. Uh, and then they went to go, they sit down, and then they're getting conversations about ass to mouth when they were expecting, I don't know, a, a Bing Crosby uh, movie or a, a Neil Simon play or something. I don't I don't know what the old biddies were expecting, but, you know, stuff like that happens. Uh, so I don't know who would wander into Terrifier 2 that wasn't expecting it to be super violent and gory. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, but this sort of, it, you know, I just found it interesting. I just thought I'd share that. Uh, but since it is uh, spooky season and horror movie season, I wanted to talk about one little topic, and it's when people ask for horror movie recommendations. So, a as you might imagine, uh, random people will ask me for horror movie recommendations on the regular, not just during spooky season, because they know, hey, I watch a lot of movies, I have a degree in, in film studies, and horror has a special place in my heart, so I, I see a lot of horror movies, especially. And so people often ask me, like, hey, what are some good horror movies, whatever? And and maybe I'll rattle off a list of movies, or if, if I know this person, then I'll know the type of horror they like, whether they'll like the artsy A24 stuff, if they'll like mainstream studio stuff with a bunch of jump scares, if they just want to see some, like, random streaming bullshit, whatever, uh, or if they, they like the good stuff, you know, the, the French extremity, some of the South Korean stuff, uh, you know, some of the, the fucked up shit that I like, then I can tell them that stuff too. Uh, but inevitably, they'll ask, whenever I, I throw out a couple titles to them, they'll ask me a question that always stumps me, and the question is, is it scary? And I have the hardest time answering this question because no movies are scary to me. <laughs> um, I haven't been scared by a movie since I was a child. Um, now, there there are jump scares, and occasionally a a well-timed jump scare will startle me. But as, a, as that South Park episode um, so eloquently put it, there is a difference between being scared and being startled. A jump scare does not scare you. A jump scare startles you because there's a loud noise or something unexpected happens, and so you, you jump or you shake or whatever. Um, being scared is different. Being scared is like you, you check to make sure your door is locked or you're afraid to turn the lights out at night, uh, like that kind of thing. Uh, and then there's disturbed, which is something different. I've been disturbed by movies, but not necessarily scared by them. Um, so I, I, I can't answer yes to it any time anyone asks me, is it scary? Because no movie is scary to me. So I try to figure out what are they trying to get at when they ask me that? Are they asking, does it have a bunch of jump scares? Are they asking, do I think it will scare them? Like, I, I don't quite know how to answer that question because movies don't scare me. So, like, I love horror movies, but I, I don't watch them to be scared. I I watch them for, I mean, depending on what the horror movie is, I'll watch it for any number of reasons. If I'm expecting it to have social commentary or, or interesting themes or good gore or, you know, a, an artsy execution. I mean, I walk into different horror movies with different expectations. You know, a twisty narrative like Barbarian. Um, so I, I, I watch horror movies for different reasons, depending on what the horror movie is that I'm, I'm looking to see, you know, the, 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 if I walk into a, a schlocky movie from the seventies from Italy, my expectations are different than if I go to see, you know, then the next Ari Aster movie or something. 
So I always have a hard time answering that question. So I, 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 I try to figure out what the question beneath that question is. Like, you're asking me if it's scary, or you, what are you asking me about that? Are, are you asking, will it gross you out? Or are you asking, is it going to make you jump? I don't know. I'm not a jump scare fan in general, as I've said in many videos. If the pun is the lowest form of humor, then the jump scare is the lowest form of horror. Now, of course, there are some that are well executed and you sort of respect the craft behind them. Um, obviously, the, the famous jump scare in Exorcist 3 um, stands out as one of the greats. Uh, but most of the time, it's just sort of, you know, quiet, quiet, and then something loud or... Um, just something appears out of nowhere, or they close the the medicine cabinet, and there's something in the mirror type stuff. It's kind of why I I hated um, Insidious when I saw it. It just seemed like it was a lot of like not very good jump scares. Uh, but that's just me. A lot of people like those James Wan supernatural shit, and I don't. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk about that. So I I'm asking. Um, aside from wanting songs for you know your your best breakup songs that you want to share with me, um. If, if you're someone who normally asks somebody for horror movie recommendations and you're someone who asks, is it scary, what are you really asking beneath that? Because my answer is always going to be no, even if it's my favorite horror movie. Like if, you, if, if I'm recommending to you some of my favorites, like the original Dawn of the Dead or Martyrs or a Serbian film or Cannibal Holocaust or, or Midsummer or anything, if you ask me if they're scary, my answer to all of those is going to be no. Uh, but I'm also going to tell you that all of those films are excellent in their own individualized ways. Um, if, if, you're, if you want something that's old school and spooky, like you want you know, a better version of Hocus Pocus with an R rating, I can give you that, because um, I'm not a fan of Hocus Pocus. Um, so you, you kind of have to tell me what is beneath that. So if you are someone who normally asks people that when you're discussing horror movie recommendations, tell me what you're looking for when you ask, is it scary? Because uh, I think most people are asking, like, is it going to make me jump? And most of the movies that I would recommend, the answer would be no, because I think jump scares are shitty and and plebeian <laughs> and for troglodytes who don't like real horror so <laughs> i i guess uh i i guess that might be insulting to some of the people who are asking my recommendations but <laughs> i i just kind of want to know what's what's behind that so anyway so i covered um the breakup um a little talk about the blonde and rating systems and how it's interesting that post-covid theaters can't afford to be as puritanical as they they could be back uh pre-covid uh, as evidenced through the difference between Hatchet 2 and Terrifier 2's release strategies, uh, and uh, about the scary thing. So that's that's all the topics I wanted to cover in, in this particular one. Um, but go ahead and, you know, click that uh, thumbs up for the like, you know, share this on your social medias or whatever if you liked hearing me babble for a while, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification thing, so on the rare event I do upload something, you'll know it and you won't lose it. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I am... Uh, David Lennon Hawk there. You can follow me on Letterboxd. I am just Lennon Hawk there. I think I flip flopped my usernames on my last video, um, but I'm just Lennon Hawk on Letterboxd, and I'm fully David Lennon Hawk uh, on Twitter. Um, I had my Instagram as private for a while due to my now ex fiance's request, uh, so I have now made that public. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, I am uh, David Lennon Hawk there as well. I think. Uh, well, just, just Google Lennon Hawk, you'll find all my shit. Uh, but you can follow me on there now uh, without me needing to approve you to do it. Um, so go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, all my socials there. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, again, it's things are a little rough right now, but I'm, I'm dealing with it better than I normally would in, in the past. I've, I've got more... I'm in a much better place you know, in my mentally and financially than I was during the last breakup. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. All things considered. Uh, but thanks for listening and, uh, hope you have a good rest of your day, everybody. Take care.